My Little Creatures by Alina Abrosimova. I once wrote down my dreams at the tender age of 10 or 11, and the only part I remember now is a big house near the ocean with a huge bed in it. I do have a huge bed, if not a big house now. It is big, it is comfortable, it has nice linen on it, and I have it all to myself, just like the rest of the apartment. My twin sons moved out a couple of weeks ago, so grown up that they can share a place with a stranger away from their mum, but not grown up enough to separate from one another. They still take turns to call me and send messages, sometimes from each other's phones, but I can usually tell who has written each text, and their voices sound distinctly different to me. Call me crazy. Their father, however, does not pick up on those subtleties. And he gets annoyed if he realizes halfway through the conversation that he is talking to Michael, not Tony. More times than he would care to admit, he has no idea that they are playing their oldest trick, their favorite switcheroo. He plays along in his own way, buying them identical presents, trying to teach them the same things, but it's impossible to live perfectly symmetrical lives, and the boys are different in more ways than they are similar. One perfectly happy to learn about superchargers, the other one just enduring the conversation for his old dad's sake. One constantly ordering a medium well steak and the other chastising him for not trying medium rare. He hasn't lived with them for a while though, so that is why I know them better than he ever will. Or maybe I am just being a smug mother, a perfectly ordinary character in almost any life story. Having the place to myself is enjoyable, and I haven't got to the stage when I miss the twins so badly that I am ready to entice them back with warm cookies, baked dinners, tidy rooms, and other advantages of a carefree existence under your mother's wing. I started reading a lot. I drink hot chocolate and tea. I am watching old sitcoms while knitting fluffy socks, and I would also like to think that I am planting a garden. And, of course, I enjoy the peace and quiet and my perfectly comfortable bed. I usually go to sleep the moment I close my eyes and think of garden planning, but not tonight. My nice cool bedroom and my fresh sheets are not doing the trick today, and after turning my bedside light on and reading the most boring book I could find, and then checking my emails, I decided to give up and go to the lounge room. There I rearrange the cushions on the couch, cover myself with a fleece blanket, and close my eyes. Why is it easier for me to fall asleep in the lounge room? with its balcony letting in sounds from the streets and its noises coming from the kitchen, such as my ancient fridge coughing and splattering but stubbornly cooling the food inside. I couldn't answer that question for a long time, but today, as sleep starts seeping into my conscience like sweet syrup onto a pancake, I am reminded of another room, a smaller one where someone stares at a computer screen, his silhouette highlighted by a small desk lamp on the left side of him, and his name is on my lips. Andrew. I can't sleep, I say, standing in the doorway in my night t-shirt and hugging a pillow 25 years younger, a hundred times more trusting and naive. He turns his head and smiles at me. Let me set up the bed for you here. He unfolds the sofa. I lie down, still holding on to that pillow. He covers me with a blanket and gives me a kiss. Good night. This room is not as dark and quiet as the bedroom, but for some reason it's easier to fall asleep here, even though Andrew coughs occasionally or rustles some papers. He's got insomnia, so he'd be very restless lying next to me in bed, but this younger version of me can sleep almost anywhere, and this room feels like the best place of all. Much later, when it starts to get light outside, he would gently shake me, and I'd stagger out of the sofa, half asleep, him leading me into the bedroom, where we both fall asleep together. He's not in my lounge room now. In fact, I haven't even been in the same room with him for many years, and yet it is still easier for me to fall asleep on a couch under a fleece blanket than in my heavenly, comfortable bed. Once on a very hot night, when even the air conditioner couldn't help with the heat, I had to turn the fan on to get the air moving, and its buzzing noise suddenly filled me with nostalgia. Not for the good old days when there was no air conditioning in my life, but for one hot summer in a different city 
where Andrew and I used a fan day and night trying desperately to cool off. His forehead would be covered in drops of sweat and I'd lick one of them off and it wouldn't even taste that salty. One of those nights, we were lying in bed listening to the fan, our only cover a thin sheet crumpled on the floor, when I thought I heard noises coming from the kitchen. I tensed, stories about burglars climbing into apartments via balconies flashing in my head. Can you hear it? I whispered. Hear what? This noise. Can you check what it is? Andrew sighed and got up, stepping over me to get out. I could hear him walking to the kitchen, turning on the lights. And then there were noises. Pans and pots banging against each other with some swearing thrown in. What are you doing? Go away! Andrew's voice said, Get lost, I said, and stop eating the pasta. My eyes were wide open and I forgot to breathe for a while. Andrew walked back in and got back into bed. House elves, he said. Just caught one. He was eating pasta out of a bag, cheeky bugger. Not sure what to do about them little bastards. I was silent as I tried to get a grip on a single rational thought. He was quiet for a moment, too, and then started giggling. You probably thought I was crazy. Thought? I said. I still do. We laughed. House elves. Yes, house elves eating uncooked pasta and making noises in the kitchen. I didn't mind if that's all they did, although having elves who could clean and cook would probably be nicer. Andrew loved the idea of house elves. Soon after, he gave them a name. Gobies have been on a rampage again, he announced one day. Look, there are socks everywhere in the bedroom. He was right. Socks were everywhere, clean socks, thankfully, just out of the laundry, draped over the bed, the bedside table, the light, even the painting above the bed. Gobies? Aren't those fish, Andrew? I asked. No, our gobies aren't fish, although they can make faces like fish. Only when they want a girl to like them, though. They surround a girl and make fish faces because they don't know how else to make a girl like them. He pouted, biting his cheeks from the insides and opened his eyes wide. I threw a sock at him, laughing. He caught it in midair, held it with two fingers, and danced around me while I was showering him with unmatched socks that I picked up from the floor. Every time I saw him getting ready for work in the morning, tying his conservative tie and frowning at his own thoughts, I was trying to imagine him talking about gobies in one of his meetings, illustrating his points with diagrams and charts and finishing with a dance. In reality, Andrew had what they call a serious job, something that was supposed to be tedious and stressful at the same time, and he often had to work late, but he always tried to get home as early as he could and sneak in a couple of hours of work after dinner, if he had to. I was usually home by then and we had dinner together, talking about our day and watching news on television. Do you take gobies with you to work? I asked once. Not on purpose, he said, but sometimes one of them clings onto my leg and I can't shake him off so I have to take him with me. Do you shake your leg the entire way there? No, but I try to step into as many puddles as possible. Do they at least help around the office or something? Not really. It's only one of them who's been to the office and he fell for a cleaner. She's big boned and always grumpy and she nearly sucked him into a vacuum cleaner. Thank God his hairy belly got stuck. He didn't like her that much after that. Gobies were undoubtedly male. They stunk out the socks and left mugs for Andrew to pick up. Sometimes they moved my bookmarks back a few pages, probably hinting that I didn't read the text well enough the first time. They were definitely cranky in the mornings, trying to stop Andrew from doing his push-ups and crunches. Well, first I noticed that Andrew was not in his best mood in the mornings, and then he explained to me that neither were the Gobies. They were his disjointed private army, deeply entrenched in the rooms of his apartment that he bought way before I showed up in his life. They used to scare away unwanted visitors and fight with Andrew's cat when it was still alive. They accepted me, grumbling and scratching their little bellies as they scattered out of my way, but I knew that I was still their guest. I had my own closet space and my books found their way into the bookshelves and started multiplying there just like they did anywhere where I stayed for a while, but I was careful not to cross the invisible line into Andrew's space that I felt very clearly at times. 
There was no such line for house elves. They knew why Andrew was deep in thought and unresponsive sometimes. They explored the balcony and all the boxes in the house. They probably helped with choosing some of the paintings on the walls. At least, I hoped some of them were their choice and not Andrew's. The only time when I imagined they were not comfortable was when Andrew and I argued. They hid under the couch, the chairs behind bookshelves and paintings, pretending to be dust bunnies, changing color to blend in, scared, sad, and uncomprehending. And sometimes, I thought, they completely disappeared, leaving Andrew unprotected and completely alone. The contrast between the playful, inventive man who introduced me to Gobies and the angry man who argued with me and then stonewalled me for hours left me speechless, and I wondered at times how I could deal with it without my own private army that would cheer me on and support me when I was not able to support myself. One sunny morning, I woke up early for no particular reason, feeling uncharacteristically cheerful and jolly for such an early hour. I turned to Andrew and caught him closing his eyes and pretending to be asleep. Rise and shine. I whispered and pinched his cheek. Bella lollies are here. Andrew perked up and lifted himself on his elbow. Bella lollies? Yes, I said. They are here and they are expecting lollies. I jumped out of bed and made a little dance of my own consisting mostly of jumps in different directions. Gobies had company now. Bella lollies were chirpy and gentle, ready to laugh and sing at any point. They would have gone away almost immediately, though, if Andrew didn't like them. As it was, my happiest, most playful self was welcome at any time, and if Bella lollies took me to a dancing class, Andrew waited for me patiently and then would tell me how much gobies missed Bella lollies. How they looked lost, searching everywhere for their giggling faces. Mostly in the kitchen, where the search was made more tolerable by the proximity of food not daring to admit that the house felt empty without them. A few months later, he found me looking at some brochures and asked me if I wanted to go back to school, which would help me get a better job. And when I did go back, he cooked dinners and waited for me while I was away for my evening classes. When I got home and planted myself on the couch, feeling as if my brain were on fire, he would kiss me and tease me and try to summon Bella Lollies, who seemed to be too exhausted to do any mischief. Our arguments would start seemingly out of nowhere, and I would struggle to remember the reasons for any of them. Andrew would get difficult and unyielding, and his silence felt like a moat around a castle, a moat full of dark water with dead animals in it. It would drive me insane. I would start walking around the house aimlessly, picking up loose pieces of clothing and tidying up books that tended to pile up around our bed. Heavy despair would set in my stomach like bad indigestion. Shortly after the Bella Lolly showed up in our lives, something triggered another argument. One of us said something hurtful, and we stubbornly plowed on, both feeling mistreated, both burning for justice. As I was gloomily tidying up, thinking that the TV stand needed dusting and looking around to find a cleaning cloth, I could feel a bit of a giggle rising up inside. Here I was, in the middle of an argument, fear clutching my guts, what if he decides he doesn't love me anymore? What if I don't really belong here? And me thinking about rearranging CDs by color and dusting the TV cabinet. I could almost see Bella lollies in the corners of the room, clamping their palms over their mouths, struggling not to laugh. I walked back into the lounge room and said, Sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings in any way. Yeah, give me just a little time to cool off, Andrew said without turning his head. I plopped down on the couch with a book, light-headed but fine, no despair present in the vicinity of my stomach, and I was sure that somewhere under Andrew's computer desk, a goby was winking at me, telling me that everything was going to be fine. I never told anyone about gobies and bella lollies, and I am pretty sure that Andrew didn't either. Neither my parents or my friends would empathize with having imaginary house elves, and as if just the fact of it were not enough, having two separate kinds of house elves. Girlfriends are supposed to talk about stereotypically female subjects, clothes, boys, haberdashery, so we did that, sometimes managing to sneak in bits and pieces about our plans, dreams, and dashed hopes into conversations. I could imagine talking to some of my friends about sex, but definitely not gobies. Somehow, 
they were more private than any possible sexual perversions. I have talked to people about a lot of stuff since then. Fears, dramas, wild dreams, and insecurities, but I haven't met anyone who would understand anything about our house elves. Not that I tried to get them to understand. Andrew and I didn't talk that much about them to each other either. We just knew they were there when we needed them. We lived our lives, changing jobs, passing exams, traveling. We argued and we made up. We grew bored and got excited. We went our own ways to reunite and tell each other stories about our experiences, and occasionally, Gobies and Bella Lollies would come up. They did one job and did it wonderfully. When I thought of Gobies scratching their little bellies, and Bella Lollies whose laughter rang like a little bell, I couldn't help smiling. Even at my lowest, even when I was questioning everything, what I do and why and what the purpose of everything is, they would be there. A comforting thought, a ray of sunshine, a reflection of all that was good in our lives. Andrew and I never officially broke up. I went away temporarily for a job and then temporarily turned into permanently. Andrew let me go because he believed it was better for me. And I believed so at the time too. He settled eventually with someone else. A year later I found myself pregnant with twins from a man who was not sure how he felt about starting a family about having a romantic relationship that required any effort and, more importantly, about me. We got married anyway. The man I married did not care much for whimsical fantasies and looked embarrassed when I did anything silly or playful or was in any way different from what he considered normal. Mentioning anything even remotely as strange as house elves to him was unthinkable. He was an honest, hard-working man who always tried to get as far ahead financially as he could. And he called it caring for his family. It seemed that giggling that rang like a tiny bell was out of my life forever. That the Bella Lollies left me, silently, no word of warning, punishing me for leaving the man who introduced me to Gobies. I caught a train to work every day. Staring out of the window at the industrial landscape and graffiti on the fence around the train line. Set in never-ending meetings about new workplace procedures and read books about happiness on the way home. Every day seemed the same, except I was getting more and more physically uncomfortable as my pregnancy progressed and sometimes I thought that I couldn't bear it anymore. But I didn't have a choice. The twins... Michael and Tony came a week before the date the doctors gave me in advance. Everything about them was overwhelming. While you tried to change a nappy for one of them, the other one would always manage to get himself naked one way or another. I'd look at him and he'd let out that irresistible baby giggle and one day I realized why that giggle sounded so familiar. My twins were my gobies and my bella lollies. Full of mischief and laughter, playfulness and light, and I could feel that light rushing back into my life, despite my lack of sleep, my exhaustion, my loneliness. I left my husband and the house he bought, taking the twins with me. And still, through the struggles of being a single mother and a human full of doubts and regrets and questions, I felt like I was never quite alone. The twins are all grown up now, but they call me, and when they don't, well, I still have my house elves. They are guarding my sleep as I fall asleep on the couch, and they move pots and pans around in the kitchen while they are searching for uncooked pasta. And, when I close my eyes, I imagine that they are still looking after the man I once loved, who I will always love, just the way they look after me. Thank you for listening to My Little Creatures, an original short story by Alina Abrosimova, and produced by me, Jared I. McGee. Alina Abrosimova is originally from Tomsk, Russia. Think Siberia, not to be confused with Serbia, but currently resides in Sydney, Australia. She sails as much as she can, though she is often interrupted by a pesky full-time job. When not sailing or working, she enjoys writing, reading, learning new things, especially all things impractical, and getting to know people 
especially positive people who share her unending curiosity about our world. You can see more from Ms. Abrosimova at her blog, Sales and Commas, found at salesandcommas.wordpress.com. The first backing track for My Little Creatures was taken from MuseOpen at museopen.org. MuseOpen is a 501c3 nonprofit focused on increasing access to music by creating free resources and educational materials. They provide recordings, sheet music, and textbooks to the public for free without copyright restrictions. As they say, their mission is to set music free. The piece heard here is Piano Concerto No. 1 in E minor, Opus 11, Allegro Maestoro, String Quartet Arrangement by Frederick Chopin. Susanna Simordova is performing. A sincere thank you to MuseOpen.org and the performer for the contribution. This track is being used under a public domain Mark 1.0 license. The second backing track for this story was taken from Massive Lab, a prolific digital music composer and pioneer that can be found on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash massive dash lad. A major thank you to him as well, and this track is being used with that artist's permission. Prose will feature another story from the Sabrosa Mova in the future, but for now, sit back and stay tuned for The Origin of Shadow by Jack.